Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here uh, this afternoon. I'm going to speak from the podium. I, I find that I tend to be more energetic if, I, if I'm standing than if I'm sitting. Uh, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, Trump administration international uh, economic policy. And I think the value added that I, I hope to deliver is some discussion of the specifics of process protection that's underway. And then I will make an argument about why the next couple of years may be particularly dangerous due to the interaction of Trump administration macro and trade policy. But first, I want to make a really simple point, which it is an explicitly protectionist policy. Last night, I went back and reread his inaugural address, and it contains the following passage. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. Now, that statement is a continuation of campaign themes. There was a focus on trade deficits, including bilateral deficits. And then there were two other themes that provide, from a Trump standpoint, both an explanation for the trade deficit and a location for the solutions. One was the issue of currency manipulation. The other was so-called disastrous trade agreements. There has been continuity post-inauguration. He has undertaken some executive actions that have tightened up government procurement, made it harder to get visas to come to the United States. And there has been an aggressive use of contingent or process protection, which I'll go into detail about in a moment. Finally, as we've heard from other speakers, there has been the withdrawal from the TPP and the renegotiations under threat of abrogation of chorus and NAFTA. Okay, what about that new protection? The United States, like other countries, have laws on anti-dumping and countervailing duties, but the Trump administration has been distinguished by two characteristics. One is the use of rather obscure parts of U.S. trade law, including the global safeguards, which doesn't even require injury to domestic industry, and the use of Section 232 national security protection. Moreover, the second characteristic is the Trump administration has been unusually uh, prone to self-initiate cases. And that matters because historically, if the government self-initiates the case, rather than waiting for a domestic uh, firm to complain, uh, there is the high, higher likelihood of protection actually being implied. So if you simply take the cases from the first 100 days of the Trump administration and assume, and this is an assumption, that protection is actually applied, as you can see in the upper panel, the share of US imports under protection doubles. And you see in the lower panel, it breaks down uh, that by country. South Korea would be the worst affected. Um, the problem for a country like South Korea is, while some of these policies are aimed at China, South Korea produces products such as solar panels and steel and washing machines that get caught up. South Korea is essentially collateral damage. The single biggest change in protection would be Canada because of the perennial softwood lumber case. And as somebody mentioned yesterday, the real problem with this is that given the United States prominence in the system, the likelihood that there will be um, emulation by other countries. The Trump administration, as we've heard, is also scrapping trade agreements. We are renegotiating NAFTA. Dick Cooper pointed out yesterday that some of that is a constructive agenda, updating. But what Dick didn't mention were the bad ideas that we heard some about this morning, a five-year sunset provision, which basically undercuts the idea of having a trade agreement because it means that companies cannot invest with any certainty about the rules of the game would be. Tighten rules of origin, particularly in automobiles. The rules of origin that the United States is uh, proposing on automobiles are designed to disrupt the existing supply chains. The North American auto market is highly integrated. If these rules go through, it will mean real inefficiency is introduced into that North American market. The long-term effect will be the movement of production from North America into China. Um, and as we heard uh, earlier this morning, these sort of strange arguments about trade balances. Um, if, the, uh, if the renegotiation fails and NAFTA is abrogated, the snapback for Canada is to the U.S.-Canada FDA, and you can imagine the U.S. and Canada basically working out a new deal that modernizes that agreement. But for Mexico, this, the threat is much more existential. Uh, there would be real impact in terms of production in Mexico, and strangely, from a Trump standpoint, the likelihood would be a depreciation of the peso and an increase in the bilateral trade imbalance, not a reduction. The Korea Free Trade Agreement was slated for uh, abrogation. Uh, fortunately, Kim Jong-un stepped in and with the sixth nuclear test, took that off the agenda. But it's been simply pushed to the back burner and uh, there is still the possibility of abrogating chorus.
Now, in anticipation of the election last year, uh, I did some modeling along with some colleagues at the Peterson Institute to look at what the impact would be in the United States, modeling trade wars with China and Mexico. And, as, and what you can see from um, that map is that um, the, um, the effects are significant and they are they are not uniform across the states. Capital goods industries would be the worst hit, both because of the decline in domestic investments associated with the trade war, uh, as well as a reduction of exports of those goods. But what's really interesting is there are large employment losses in non-tradables, and because of the pattern of hiring in those sectors, what we find is that the, uh, the, the most of the US casualties in a trade war would be among the most vulnerable people in society. The, the effects of a trade war in the United States would be regressive. Uh, Washington, poor Washington, is the worst affected state. But we also looked at some scenarios that looked at asymmetrical forms of retaliation. Things like China stopping buying aircraft, or having an embargo on soybeans, or instructing state-owned enterprises not to buy US business services. And we've also looked at what might happen in some uh, cases if chorus were abrogated. That would include the loss of preferences in the beef market to countries like Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, which we uh, expect would mean the elimination of US beef exports, in, at least in the short run, as well as also loss of uh, business services to EU competitors. In the case of aircraft, aircraft production is highly localized. Certain geographical areas are hit hard. In the case of business services, the areas that are hit under either of these actions basically constitute a map of the high-tech urban areas of the United States. But from a political economy standpoint, possibly the most interesting part is um, the uh, two agricultural cases. Uh, you can see on the map uh, there is a, a patch of green that runs from Mississippi through Arkansas, Tennessee, and into Missouri. That's the impact of a soybean embargo by China. The loss, the reason it's very interesting is twofold. First of all, if say you're in Seattle and you lose your job, you're losing your job, which is not good, but you're losing it in the context of large urban labor market with public transportation. If you lose your job in one of those contiguous rural counties, uh, you are in real trouble. And the job losses, direct plus indirect, in some of these counties, one county was as high as 25%. There were about a dozen counties where it exceeded 10%. Likewise, in the beef case, you can see those yellow dots. They are in these sort of uh, plains states. The reason why this is interesting is that those areas are represented by Republicans. And uh, if, the, if the Trump administration is to be constrained politically, it is likely to become through agricultural interests in the United States. The real threat, though, is the interaction of the macro policy and the trade policy. Uh, we, the United States, for a variety of reasons, is likely to adopt uh, expansionary fiscal policy. That's going to lead to a growth spurt, widening budget and trade deficits, appreciating exchange rate. And then you face the prospect of uh, the Trump administration reaching for protection, trying to square the circle with that increasing trade deficit. And what we could get is a very nasty version of the first Reagan administration, that, that uh, an administration that, in the infamous words of then Secretary of Treasury James Baker, imposed more protection than any US presidential administration since Herbert Hoover. Uh, this is a, a period of time well known for voluntary export restraints. The uh, current uh, USTR, Mr. Ambassador Lighthizer, was actually one of the negotiators um, and is well versed with uh, this kind of action. There is one huge difference, though. In the context of the Cold War, and normally I have to say most of you don't remember that, but in the context of the Cold War, actually this audience, you do remember it. You were all senior officials at the time. Um, <clears throat> In the context of the Cold War, we were the ultimate, the United States was the ultimate uh, political and guarantor of Japan. And however grudgingly, at the end of the day, the Japanese were going to go along with American demands in the trade policy area. Needless to say, the relationship between the United States and China today uh, could not be more different. So just to recapitulate, um, oh, I just lost it. Um, this is a new policy. There is a real, there, this is a break with the past. It is explicitly protectionist. It is in the works. So some of these decisions for legal reasons have not yet been made, but they are in train. And the conflict between trade and macro policies are going to make it worse to the detriment of the United States and all of its trade partners. Thank you.